you know what to do. I have to talk a lot of people through that. So. I, I feel like if you don't know how to use Zoom after this, like there's no excuse. <laughs> my line of work or in your line of work at this point, right? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so I have just like a, a lot of random questions that we've just been sure. kind of getting into our newsroom that different reporters have that I have. Um, so we'll just bounce them all off you and whatever you can answer, great. Yep. Um, first, obviously, today uh, is a big day. Last day to register to vote in Ohio. I guess, um, you know, how, your thoughts on how things are going so far. You know, it's more challenging this year to get people registered to vote because you can't go out as, as easily with clipboards and, and that kind of thing. So we've been trying to find all kinds of creative ways to get people registered to vote. We've partnered with the Ohio Craft Brewing Association to put uh, right there on on cans and bottles of craft beer at over 50 brewer, brewers throughout the state. We've worked with uh, uh, barber shops and, and beauty salons to put posters up. We've got a barber here in Columbus that has registered over 2,000 voters at his barber shop. So a lot of cool things happening. I know that groups like the League of Women Voters are out there doing voter registration on college campuses. Both the college Republicans and college Democrats are working to do that, and it's working. In fact, this weekend, we, we went over a big number. Uh, for the first time ever, we surpassed 8 million registered voters in the state of Ohio, and that's really exciting. I'm so excited to see that, and that tells me that Ohioans are going to make their voice heard, and it's easier than ever to get registered online at voteohio.gov. All you got to do is have your state ID or driver's license. You go to voteohio.gov, and you get registered there. And if you want to do it in person or if you don't uh, want to use the internet, you can go to your county board of elections. And I've ordered them all to stay open until eight, or until 9 p.m. tonight. They'll all be there until 9 p.m. If you want to go to your county board of elections and get registered, you can do it that way as well. Okay. Um, so obviously this year is very different with how things are running. But uh, I guess, you know, so far, if you had to narrow it down to one problem, biggest issue you guys have been seeing so far. You know, our focus continues to be on poll worker recruitment. We need to have 55,000 trained Ohioans ready to go to run these polling locations. The bare minimum is 37,000. Just to open 4,000 polling locations, we need 37,000 Ohioans. I'm happy to report that we've already had 46,000 sign up, but what that means is that we still have more to go to make sure that we've got that re reserve force trained and, and ready. And so we're asking Ohioans to go to voteohio.gov where you can sign up to be a poll worker. Here's what will happen next. Your County Board of Elections will give you a call. They'll schedule you for training. Uh, they'll assign you to a polling location or assign you to be one of those reserve force poll workers ready to go on Tuesday, November 3rd, if we need to call you into the game. Okay. Um, I remember back a month or so ago, you were at a, at a press conference. You talked about um, the revamp of the Secretary of State's website um, and how, you know, has that been kind of, do you think, helping people get registered to vote easier? Um, and how is that going? So we've made voteohio.gov the one-stop shop for everything you need to know for elections. And in a time where there's a lot of eh, untrustworthy information, unfortunately, out there on the internet, we're emphasizing that the trusted source for elections information is to go to the official .gov website, voteohio.gov. There you can get registered to vote. You can sign up to be a poll worker. You can find out how to request an absentee ballot and so much more. So voteohio.gov is the place to go. Okay, on absentee ballots, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, calling into question on how safe they are and how, um, you know, they're going to go this election, especially with the problems we've been having with uh, the USPS uh, Postal Service. I guess, can you talk to me a little bit about um, what, how safe uh, elect absentee ballots are in Ohio and what county boards of elections do to make sure all those votes get counted? Yeah, there's a lot of noise out there and it's created confusion. Here's what Ohioans should know. For close to 20 years, both Republicans and Democrats have been voting absentee. It's a safe and trustworthy process. We have important safeguards in place. Like, for example, we maintain accurate voter rolls in Ohio. You have to prove your identity when you request a ballot and then prove your identity again when you mail the ballot back in. Ohioans can track their ballot to make sure it's received at the Board of Elections. So just like you would track a package you order online, you can go to voteohio.gov and actually track your ballot. And so Ohioans know and trust absentee voting. And by the way, here's what proves that over 2 million Ohioans have already requested their absentee ballot. That shows you that they know that this is a safe and secure way to vote as it relates to the Postal Service, especially, uh, you know, up in the Toledo area. We know that there had been some concern about the Toledo area mail being shipped to Detroit and that taking some extra time. Uh, we've worked with the Postal Service. I've had several conversations with the U.S. Postmaster General and others from the U.S. Postal Service 
service. They've made it clear that election mail is their top priority. We're going to now hold them to account to actually deliver on that promise. They've committed to moving election mail sorting. Uh, instead of sending it all the way up to Detroit, they're going to keep it here in Ohio. They've committed to doing what's called an all clear procedure, where they're going to go through those sorting facilities each day and make sure that no election related mail is still sitting around. And they've also worked to establish relationships at the local level. So each county board of elections is getting to know their local postal carriers and their local postmaster to make sure that they exchange cell phone numbers and, uh, and can work very closely together. So the Postal Service said that election mail is their top priority. We're going to hold them to account on that. Ohioans trust voting by mail. But if you don't want to vote by mail, if you still want to vote absentee, but you don't want to mail it back, there's another option for you. Uh, Ohioans can return their ballot directly to the Board of Elections. Every county Board of Elections has a secure 24-7 drop box. By the way, this is the first time ever in a general election that that's been the case in Ohio. And so it's easier to vote than it's ever been, and it's easier to vote absentee than it's ever been. Okay. Um, on those uh, drop boxes, I know there has been some kind of back and forth on you know, whether or not counties will have more than one. Will you allow this election to have a each county, you know, that wants to, I know Lucas County has been requesting it, um, to have more than one drop box? So here's what we're going to do to make sure that we're not creating confusion uh, right before an election. We know that early voting begins tomorrow. Ohioans are already going to be starting to return their absentee ballots tomorrow. Every county board of elections is going to have drop boxes there at their county board of elections. They can have more than one at that location. But what we're not going to do is expand it beyond that location. This is a question for the General Assembly to take up. I've actually had conversations already this morning with both the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. I think this is something important for the General Assembly to create in law so that there's no confusion about this going forward. But let's not be distracted by this. That's never been, you know, the, the thing that we've really needed to focus on. Ohioans know that the way that you return an absentee ballot is you mail it back in. If you don't want to mail it back in, you can return it to the Board of Elections. That's the way that Ohioans have done it for a long time. We're keeping our eye on the ball and reminding Ohioans that it's convenient to vote in Ohio, whether it's absentee, whether it's early voting, or whether it's in-person election day voting. There's no good excuse for not making your voice heard in Ohio. Do you think moving forward in the future, there could be an opportunity to have more than one drop box in each county in different locations? Yeah, I've already said very clearly that that's a public policy matter that I think is a fine idea, but it has to be taken up by the General Assembly. Uh, I don't think that the Secretary of State on, on his own should be, you know, should be making policy like that. I'm not a lawmaker. I used to serve in the State Senate, uh, but now it's up to the members of the State House and State Senate to make the policies as it relates to election. I carry out uh, the, the, the state legislature's wishes and, 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 and operate with the boards of elections to make sure that we can do so in a fair and secure way. Okay. Um, signature validations. Explain what they are, um, who does them, and how those work. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing that has been a part of elections in Ohio really since the beginning of our state. Uh, when somebody requests a ballot, the signature has to match. When they send back their ballot, the signature has to match. We use signature matching for people signing petitions. Signature matching is a well understood process. And by the way, it's all done in a bipartisan way. So if there is a signature that's going to be rejected for mismatching, it is voted on by both the Republicans and the Democrats who serve on your county board of elections. Now, the good news is this, signature mismatches are exceedingly rare. I think in the year 2016, there were something like 700 ballots that were rejected because of a mismatching, mismatching signature. And so that's exceedingly rare, but it is an important safeguard that exists and will continue to exist in Ohio. Okay. Um, when it comes to voter fraud, I guess, what is the last instance of voter fraud you can recall here in Ohio? Oh, goodness. You know, we had a small number of prosecutions several months ago that we referred to county prosecutors and to the attorney general for people that had tried to vote more than once or in some cases had voted more than once in Ohio and in another state. But it's such a tiny fraction of a percent. Voter fraud is exceedingly rare. The reason it's rare, though, is because we've got good laws in place to keep it rare. And so, you know, when you hear people out there claiming that there's rampant widespread voter fraud, it's just not true. Voter fraud is rare, but we work to keep it rare by enforcing the laws we have on the books. Okay. Um, on the, in, the, in a situation where a vote doesn't get counted, is that typically something that is a human error or is that a computer error? 
it's almost always a human error. And this is why we've redesigned the instruction forms, by the way, we worked with a group called the Center for Civic Design. And so when you request an absentee ballot now, when you get it, it's gonna come with an all new instruction sheet that lays out very clearly how to return it, how to avoid those errors. Honestly, the most common error is somebody forgetting to put their birth date. They'll put today's date instead of their birth date. So we've made it, we've, we've made it even clearer and bolder that it's your birth date, not today's date that needs to go in that birthday line. Uh, but here's the good news. If you make a mistake, as long as you send it back soon, and by the way, this is one of the reasons why we're encouraging voters not to procrastinate. Once the Board of Elections gets it and they find that mistake, they can call you and get it corrected. They can email you and get it corrected. That's why we ask you to put your email address and your cell phone number or your home phone number right there on the absentee ballot request form because the boards of elections want your vote to count. The boards of elections aren't there to try to keep people from voting. The boards are there to try to help people vote. And so they're going to work with voters uh, to make sure that if they made an error that that can get corrected. Okay. In the, you know, past couple of elections, we've seen a lot more when it comes to, you know, election projections and where certain candidates sit at the, you know, within the race, you know, moving in. I guess in a perfect world, or if you, you know, were to decide, do you think that those, those polls that, you know, national media outlets release influence people's votes? Um, and do you think that, I mean, if you were to decide, how would you have us report on that? Well, you know, I think that the First Amendment protects the right of journalists to, to report how they see fit. And, and polling is part of that. I think, you know, I think any of us that have ever kind of looked under the Christmas tree to try to figure out what we're getting, uh, none of us like to wait for that result, right? Uh, and that includes voting. And so we love polls. We want to know uh, where things are heading. People are interested in that. But here's what's important. We need to be very thoughtful about how we report on election night, because election night is always just a snapshot in time. What we report on election night is always the unofficial result. And so this idea that election night is sort of this reality TV thing where you're going to get to go to bed that night knowing who won and who lost, that may not be the case. It may not be fully conclusive because what we're going to report on election night is every absentee ballot that's come in up until 730, every early vote ballot that's come in, and every election day ballot. We're going to report all those as quickly as we can. It, wait, it may go into the, the wee hours of Wednesday morning, but we're going to report that number. But it's always just the unofficial number because there's still 10 days for ballots to continue coming in as long as they were postmarked by Monday, November 2nd. And so here's something new that we're changing about the way that we're doing election night reporting. We're featuring right there at the top of the website the number of outstanding absentee ballots. Here's why that matters. That's a knowable number. We know how many ballots we mailed out and we know how many ballots have come back. And it's important for, for folks to know that there are still a number of outstanding ballots. And so here's a, a hypothetical. Say your favorite candidate is ahead by a million votes on election night and there's 200,000 outstanding absentee ballots. Well, you know that you can call it at that point. Numerically, that contest is over. But the flip side, if your favorite candidate's ahead by 100,000 votes and there are 200,000 outstanding absentee, well then just by definition, that contest is not over yet. And any candidate that tried to declare victory based on those scenarios would, would look foolish for, for doing so. So it's important for people to kind of have that civics lesson and understand the way election night reporting really works. Okay. Um, you know, right now, obviously, our president is in the hospital being treated for COVID-19. Um, this could have happened to anyone, I suppose. But what if there's a situation in Ohio where you know, Trump or any candidate is unable to run for president or for a certain office and the ballots are already printed. How, what does that process look like? Well, of course, uh, we keep the president and first lady in our prayers, as well as the journalists and staff members that have been infected and any Ohio and any American who's been infected with COVID-19. Of course, the U.S. Constitution and the federal laws lay out how uh, you know candidates can be replaced. Generally, it's something that, that the parties do. Uh, but again, uh, there are a lot of legal scholars that, that, that want to debate this. There are a number of interesting articles about it. But of course, uh, we expect and, and we pray uh, that the president has a, a full recovery and, and can stand uh, for election because again that's what the the voters in the republican primary ch chose him to be their their their, their standard bearer uh, and we want everybody to be healthy throughout this process but it's an interesting constitutional and legal question for sure and there are a lot of fun articles out there that kind of lay out all these different scenarios for what happens up to election day or after election day or even up until the oath of office is taken in january 
Okay, so there's, I guess, no like clear cut process on what happens to those ballots then? Well, the ballots are already printed in Ohio. So reprinting ballots at this point is not going to happen. And again, God forbid, if any candidate was to be unable to stand for election because of health reasons or, or whatever else, uh, then there are processes in place where generally the party uh, will announce the replacement for that candidate. But again, it's different depending on the timeline of where you are. And I'm not a legal or constitutional scholar, so I'm not going to get too far, far out over my skis on that. Hey, Amy, we're about out of time. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I got a lot more to go. Okay, um, I guess the one last question that I have, uh, signs at polling places, where are the exact rules on that? So what the law says is that there is a 100 foot buffer around every polling location, and you're not allowed to do any campaigning inside that buffer, which is, you're not supposed to wear your favorite candidate's hat or shirt or button or carry a sign inside. Uh, and so that's something that our poll workers enforce to make sure that people aren't violating that 100 foot buffer outside of that. Of course, you know, the First Amendment's in full effect. People can campaign all they want, but what you can never do is obstruct or delay or block a voter. That's something that we would never tolerate. And we've already made it very clear, by the way, in a memo that we've sent out to law enforcement all over the state of Ohio, uh, what their responsibilities are to help us and to help their county board of elections maintain that flow so that voters can come and go from their polling location completely unobstructed. But inside of a polling location, no campaigning. So leave your favorite candidate's hat or shirt at home when you go to vote. All right, thank you so much.